This week's chapter covers empiricism, associationism, positivism, and common sense psychology. So we are covering a lot of different areas. Um, this is a this is a big time in the history of philosophy and, and psychology for a lot of change, a lot of new ideas to come about. Uh, I want to start by giving, like I usually do, a basic background of what was going on at this time. So. Um, we finished the last chapter talking about the Renaissance. The Renaissance was this emergence from a very dogmatic, religiously focused time. So this, this kind of gave way to the scientific revolution, which is, we talked a little bit about this last in last class. That was the time where we had a lot of discoveries in astronomy, a lot of discoveries in physics, and really the scientific revolution was this shift in the power and authority that science was given in stating kind of truths about the world. So for a long time, religion was the, was the only authority when it came to what was true and how people should live. After the Renaissance, we had this explosion, especially in Western Europe, of, of science and scientific thought. And science kind of took its place um, alongside religion and, and potentially you could say even surpassed religion in some areas in terms of what people thought was the the appropriate system for telling them things that were true about the world the enlightenment followed on a little bit after that and the enlightenment was really this movement by intellectuals at the time to change maybe the way that societies were structured or to at least think differently about how society should be run based on the way we were learning new things about how the world worked uh, as a result of the scientific revolution. So these were large shifts in the way people were thinking about the world. To be clear, this was this this change in thought, this change in philosophy was a, it was a movement about human nature. It was a movement where there was a different emphasis put on how we could understand ourselves as humans. And and it was moving away and I think I, I mentioned this in our last class it was moving away from telling people how they should live and prescribing the types of behaviors that people should engage in. And instead, it was interested in understanding what people were like, right? So the types of questions that people were asking and the ways that people were approaching knowledge about humans themselves were fundamentally different. Um, as a result of the scientific revolution, human beings and human nature was thought to be knowable. Now this is something that wasn't the case before the scientific revolution. There was not necessarily any notion of what human nature was or how humans worked. It was very magical. We thought that uh, for a long time that human beings were just kind of divine and special and that it was beyond comprehension how they worked, right? We, we've come across people who had some ideas. Um, Plato and Aristotle had ideas about the forms and about souls and and about the, how those worked, but the inner workings of that were really a, still a huge mystery. And what the, the Renaissance and then the scientific revolution did was it made human beings, it made animals in, in general, and then as, as it progressed, human beings in particular, more understandable. We we sought to, to see how the muscles and the nerves worked in order to, to make a body move and to make a body behave. And so that took some of this mystery out of what it was to be human, right? And so the way that this led to the Enlightenment was it was kind of a natural follow-on. We said, well, if we can start to understand human nature and who humans are and how we work, then potentially we should think differently about how we run societies and maybe kings and lords and dictatorships aren't the best way to run things. Maybe if there is such a thing as human nature and if human beings have natural tendencies, maybe we can restructure society to be more compatible with those tendencies and to make things fundamentally better for human beings. Right? So the Enlightenment then was a movement that was very progressive. It was very much opposed to religion and tradition and dogmatism that had been the authority for a long, long time. 
So let's talk about some of the social factors that were kind of involved in this Enlightenment movement. Um, so as a consequence of the scientific revolution, we remember we talked about last week, uh, Francis Bacon really brought about empiricism, right? So he, he kind of fundamentally changed how we were going to go and understand the world prior to Francis Bacon. People would just kind of observe their day, and then they would kind of think. They would they would they would sit in their office or sit in their room or wherever they were, and they would come up with theories pretty much in their head about the way the world worked, right? And it was just kind of a hobby for most people. So what Francis Bacon did was really formalize what it meant to study the world scientifically and, and empirically, um, and he made it what we would call functional. There was a point to it. And that point was was to understand nature so that we could take control of it, so that it could be useful for us in making our lives better. And he also proposed that scientific ideas should be conducted by a lot of people. They should go out, they should test things, they should gather evidence, and they should bring that back and put it all together. We should accumulate these stores of evidence, and then we should tell other people about what we found so we could get a sense of the bigger picture that all of that evidence pointed to. The other thing that was going on, and this is kind of a generalization, but we would say there was an escape from the Malthusian trap. Um, Thomas Malthus developed this theory of, of e e economics, essentially, and said that the world's, the, the total economics of the world, or the average wealth of any given person, was for a long time a function of the number of people that were alive at any given point in time because most people made their wealth from farming, from growing things or, or, or raising things on land, right? So your ability to make money was directly tied to the amount of land that you could own. And when there were more people, each person had a smaller chunk of land. When there were less people, each person had a bigger chunk of land. So the interesting thing was for a long, long time, when farming was really the only way that people were making money, things like plagues and major sicknesses and wars, which would wipe out a lot of people, actually made everybody on average a little bit wealthier because there were less people to kind of share this total wealth that was available in the form of land throughout the world, right? So it's this kind of weird paradox where for a long time, the fewer people there were, the richer everybody was because they all had a bigger chunk of this overall plot of land that wasn't changing. When we hit the Industrial Revolution, that changed. When people started making things, and you could make a lot of things in one small piece of land, the average wealth started to go up and up and up, and that was not tied to the amount of land people owned anymore. So that changes the value of cities, right? Because it, before that time, if everybody was living, if there was a whole bunch of people living in a small city, well then those people were probably all poor for the most part because they couldn't do anything with the land that they had in that city. Now people could, within the early industrialization, when people could start making things and selling things in one small area, people could move to cities, they could collaborate, and they could all get rich together because they could all trade their goods and services to each other and they could all be better off for it, right? So this was a big change in the way that wealth actually got distributed and, and it brought people together in bigger cities. And as an overall result, there was this change in what the good life was, what people were striving for. From the time of ancient Rome, people had been kind of concerned with living well, this, this idea of arit that was an ancient Roman idea. Well, that started to be less important, and people were more concerned with just being happy, right? They weren't, they weren't necessarily concerned with following the dictates and the traditions of their religion and living properly anymore. People started wanting to be happy, and that's, that we're probably more familiar with that today because it's kind of the era, era that we're living in now. So let's talk about how that led to the Enlightenment, what the Enlightenment even was. So first of all, this is a, a social movement that happened 
towards the late 17th, early 18th century, so the, the end of the 1600s, the beginning of the 1700s. And it mostly happened in, in Europe, so Britain, France, Germany. Uh, the United States had early colonies at this time, so the Enlightenment was, was influential there. And Russia to an extent. We'll, your book talks a little bit about some influential Russian scientists and, and thinkers of the time. But this was pretty limited, so to a large extent, the Enlightenment didn't really take hold in Russia like it did through most of Western Europe and the U.S. So the point of the Enlightenment was it placed a bigger emphasis on reason and individualism as opposed to tradition. So it was a change in the way, I won't, I won't say it's a change in the way society was structured, but it was a push for a change in the way society was structured so that individual rights mattered more than they had traditionally mattered. And the use of reason and, and basically formalized notions of thinking and discovering knowledge were seen as way more important than they had been in the past. In the past, tradition, uh, religious tradition specifically, was the real way to, to know about the world, or that's, that's what people followed. The Enlightenment focused on reason, so understand, using reason to understand what was true and what was the best way to run a, uh, a society. And it's really important to note that this movement, this Enlightenment movement, was not just something that your average person in the city was pushing for, right? The Enlightenment ended up um, coming up with philosophies that were important for revolutions like the American Revolution and the French Revolution. But the Enlightenment didn't start with your average person on the street. This was a movement guided by intellectuals, wealthy people, aristocracy, people who were basically financially well off enough that they could sit around debating philosophy all day and, and changing kind of the way that they were thinking about, about social philosophy. And, and they also had the ability to write books and manuscripts and get those books published uh, so that they could get their thoughts out there, right? So most, most people in general at this time were not literate and they didn't have the means or the time to publish books or publish anything that, that had anything to do with their philosophy. So the only people that really had the means to do that were wealthy intellectuals. So that's who was really running the show in the Enlightenment movement. Um, and as we already mentioned, a lot of the thinking that went along, that went into the Enlightenment, was a direct consequence of the scientific revolution. It was a result of people understanding that science could tell you things about the world that were useful, that they would let you predict what was going to happen. It was going to let you take control of the world for your own benefit. Uh, and it, a lot of people started seeing that they could make their lives better by using science as a tool to understand the world in a, in a more complete way than they had done before. So there was also a change in the types of questions that people were asking during this time. So people started focusing more on asking, how can we know things? This is different from what can we know. So most of what we've been talking about up to this point in class was talking about what types of knowledge were possible. When you look back at Plato and Aristotle's theories about the mind, or um, especially if we talk about Aristotle and then Ibn Sibba and Thomas Aquinas and some of these different philosophers who had these theories about what the senses were and what sensory information took in. and It was all about what types of knowledge we can have so it was focused on what can we know. At the Enlightenment, a big change here, people are less concerned with what we can know. It's kind of like we answered that question and people were kind of agreeing on the types of knowledge that were possible, but they were more concerned with how can we know these things? How do we come to, to gain this knowledge? And this is also probably a consequence of a rise in the development of machines in people being more interested in building machines and understanding the inner workings of those machines, well, they were now also interested in understanding the inner, the inner workings of human beings, kind of like a machine. 
So this, this was kind of the natural next question to ask. We already talked about it a little bit, but people were interested in understanding what human nature was. So instead of saying, how should humans behave, this is more asking the question, how do humans typically behave? What's normal for a human? Um, people started asking more questions about what is morality, right? And, and this gets a little complex, but it's kind of tied to these questions about how can we know things and what can we know, right? So if, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but at some point people started questioning if it was possible that we could know much of, of anything at all with a high degree of certainty. So if we can't know a lot of things with a high degree of certainty, then the question starts to become, how can we know good from bad, right from wrong with any kind of certainty as well? And if, if we can't know those types of things with certainty, then how can we say that some things, some behaviors are moral, some behaviors are immoral, if we can't really be sure with 100% certainty what things are good and what things are bad? And so this actually starts to be a big question when it comes to how society should structure its laws because we start questioning what type of knowledge those laws are based on, right? And, and so, so that does fundamentally lead people to question how society should be structured, how should societies work to represent the people that live within them, right? And so one of the first big movements of this or, or after the Enlightenment was British empiricism. So when I talk about a movement, now we're getting into these kind of sections or these different schools within philosophy that had kind of a common approach to understanding the mind and what the mind was and what it did and, and what people's human nature was like. Um, so we're going to talk about a couple of different areas of, of philosophy where people had a common set of beliefs or assumptions about the way the mind worked and the way humans in general worked. So British, the British empiricists were the first big group. So it's first I think we should be clear. Um, so British empiricism is not some sort of formal system of science. Um, if we were to talk about an empirical approach to science today, we're, we're talking specifically about formally going out, collecting and measuring data in a certain way, and subjecting that data to the scientific method. So that's not where we are yet with British empiricists. We didn't have a scientific method yet. Empiricism from the British standpoint in this period of time was more about going out and gathering data through observations and experience, not in a formal way, but by you know, kind of like we've talked about in the past when we talked about Aristotle and we talked about Thomas Aquinas, just going out and observing and interacting with the world and then formulating theories about how humans worked, how the mind works, how the world works, based on some careful observation and experience here. Not necessarily any specific formal model for how to take measurements and quantify things and test hypotheses. We're not there yet but it's more about going out and, and trying to observe things in a very specific and intentional way in order to develop theories about how the world works based on those observations. So what the big important thing is about this view is that it assumes that your experiences and your observations are providing you with some valid useful information for you to build your theories of the world. Now, you probably remember there have been there's been a lot of times throughout the class already where we've talked about people questioning whether this was a valid assumption right do our experiences tell us something real about the world we can go the whole way back to plato and aristotle and they fundamentally disagreed on this question plato did not trust experiences and sense information to give him valid information about the world. He felt that this information was flawed and so he relied on reason to find out what was true. Aristotle, on the other hand, believed that reason was flawed and so he felt that going out and gathering information about the world using sensory information was the only way to find out what was true, right? So that's been a big debate for a long time 
It's still a debate in this period in time, but the British empiricists are really coming down on the side of Aristotle, assuming that the information gained by our experiences tells us something about the world and that we're going to rely on that information to build theories about how the world works. Now, we'll see as we go here, people aren't just assuming that, the, that their experiences tell them perfect knowledge about the world. People make a lot of uh, very careful assumptions about what they can and what they can't know through their experiences. But this is the basis for most of this, uh, most of the British empiricist theories, is that their experiences are the way to, to find out about the world. Right? So there was a big argument, uh, by and large, anybody that's considered a British empiricist would be very against the idea of innate ideas or any, any truth or knowledge that was present at the time of birth that people didn't have to actually learn. Right? So they were very pro-nurture, anti-nature. Um, the British empiricist is where we get at, at one point an extreme view that, that the, the mind is a blank slate at birth and the only things that the mind comes to, to contain throughout our life, it comes to contain those through our experiences. That was a fundamental belief of the British empiricists, that all of our knowledge is based on, on experience and sensory information, and there's nothing else in the mind that wasn't first in the senses. That was actually kind of this, this statement that, that they would all say uh, in a lot of their writings. There's nothing in the mind that wasn't first in the senses, so keep that in mind. So Thomas Hobbes is the first big British empiricist. He really founded British empiricism. All right, we'll call him Debbie Downer because he was a little bit of a, a pessimist. Um, so Thomas Hobbes had a p pretty purely mechanical view of human beings and society. He based a lot of his, his theories about humans and human behavior and the, the functioning of societies on Galileo's models of the planets and the solar system, right? He, Galileo was the first to really propose that the, the planets and all of the bodies in, in the universe, the stars, the moon, everything, moved according to some, some pre-established rules, and it moved like a machine, and, and there was some harmony and balance in that that was kind of set from the beginning, and it, 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 it followed predictable laws, and that motion of the universe would continue kind of unimpeded throughout time. So Thomas Hobbes really applied that, that theory or that, that kind of a model to human behavior. So, so one, he felt that humans were not special. We weren't different from animals in any other way. We were, we're machines just like animals are. And he went on to, to kind of propose that humans are evil and selfish and brutish and and so he was a big proponent of a strong authoritarian royal monarch go monarchy government because of that, right? So he thought that if humans were kind of left to their own devices, they would murder and pil and and pillage and plunder and and just take advantage of each other because everybody would be out for their own good, right? But he fundamentally didn't feel that humans were any different from any other animals. Um, for him, material mattered, not spirit, so he was very opposed to any theory of human behavior or any theory of anything that proposed any sort of spiritualism or magical magical beliefs or, or something that you couldn't observe, right? He was a really strict empiricist. He thought that the only things that were real were biological and, and that they, they operated in, an, in a mechanical kind of way, and so that... That led to his theories of consciousness. He felt that consciousness was was nothing that gave us free will or anything like that. That it was just a phenomenon that arose from the motions of the brain. So he just kind of felt like consciousness is a byproduct. And that's still a very prominent theory today. Um, he was one of the first to propose the view that all of our knowledge arises from our sensation. So no such thing as innate ideas. Anything that we come to know comes to us through the senses first. Uh, and like I said before, didn't believe in free will at all. He felt that um, if, if we really under, 
understood as much as we could about human behavior, we would see that everything is kind of predetermined. So he was a materialist. He believed that physical matter is the only thing that there is and that, that all of human behavior or all of everything that happens in the universe is just based on, on the physical properties. There's nothing extra. There's no souls. There's no... There's no non-physical entity in the world that, that affects behavior at all. He was a determinist. He felt that uh, there's no such thing as free will, that everything that is going to happen is going to happen because the behavior of the universe is just going to follow along some predetermined path uh, throughout all of time. And he was a reductionist, which meant that he believed that... Um, Everything that we know, and this is everything in the physical world, and because he was a materialist, that meant everything in the mind as well, could be broken down and understood in terms of very simple fundamental properties. So this is kind of like we talked about atomists back in Greece and the theory of atoms. Well, atoms is a very reductionist theory. Um, the notion of atoms says that everything that we, every every piece of physical matter is made up of these fundamental particles called atoms, and they just go together in different ways, and that gives us all of the physical things that we have in the world. Thomas Hobbes bought into that completely, and he felt that the same was true for any all, all of mental life as well, that we could break down mental life into some very specific fundamental pieces and understand it from its simplest parts. Okay, so after Thomas Hobbes, we want to talk a little bit about John Locke. John Locke was hugely influential in the Enlightenment. He was a huge influence to the early American and French revolutions. Uh, and he had a big impact on philosophies of the mind. So he was influenced by Descartes, but he was not in agreement with Descartes necessarily. So he was, um, he was influenced by Descartes in the... He felt that the mind only knows ideas, right? Remember, Descartes doubted everything except for his own doubts and then realized that was the one thing that he could be sure of is that he, he thought, right? I think, therefore, I am. And so Locke agreed with that part, and he kind of took it to an, a, little, a little more of an extreme view. He says the mind only knows ideas. That's the only thing that we can be sure of is that are the thoughts that exist in our mind. He proposed that these ideas come from experience. So whereas Descartes felt that there were some innate ideas, Locke went the whole way and said, no, there's no such thing as innate ideas. Any ideas that we have are, are ideas that started in experience or started in our senses. He proposed that there were two fountains of knowledge. Um, fountains of knowledge means the way... They are sources of ideas, right? The first was sensation, and so sensation gives us sights, smells, sounds, touch, tastes. Um, so it gives us these basic, simple ideas about the world. Reflection was the second fountain of knowledge for Locke, and he said that reflection is when we think about senses that we've had in the past, right? So. We get these basic ideas through senses, and then if we if we think back on those senses, or we we exam if our mind examines traces of those senses that have previously been there, that's reflection. So he's kind of adding this ability of the mind, saying that not only can the self or the mind perceive the outside world, so we don't just gather sensory information and that's it for mental life. But he says the mind can also perceive itself. So we perceive things in our sensory world, but we also perceive the workings of the mind, right? And that's what allows us, in, in John Locke's view, to be able to basically have memory or have thoughts about the future. It's the ability to think about the senses that we, we've had in the past, right? Now, there's a really interesting consequence of this that's very important, right? So if this is an ability of the mind, if the mind has the ability to perceive its own workings, we, we need to know, does the mind perceive its own workings in an accurate manner? If it does, great. Then we can investigate psychological and mental life 
by asking questions about what we perceive about our own minds. But if the mind does not accurately perceive its own operations or its own workings, then we've got a problem. Because one, we wouldn't know it because all we can be aware of is the perceptions that we have, this reflection on our own mind. So we have no idea if those perceptions are accurate or not. It seems accurate to us, but we have no idea if that's valid. And if it's not valid, then using basic, then, then using those perceptions of our own thinking as a way to study the mind is very problematic, right? Because we're basically, we're not using valid information. We're not examining psychology using valid information, right? If we can't accurately, if our minds can't accurately perceive their own operations. And this is still potentially a problem today. We talked a little bit about introspection in the past. Essentially, Locke is talking about introspection here. He's saying that our ability to think about what we're thinking or think about what's going on in the mind and report on that, that's introspection. Um, and he's, he's calling that a source of a uh, fountain of knowledge. But we've already seen that other people have had problems with introspection as a way to study psychology. And that could be very problematic if introspection doesn't lead to a valid perception of the how our mind is working. Locke also proposed this difference between simple and complex ideas. So simple ideas are really basic qualities. There's something that can't be broken down any further. So like a color or the speed at which something's moving or the size of an object, right? So these very basic, fundamental, simple ideas. And to him, those simple ideas could be combined to form complex ideas. Complex ideas would be something that maybe combines color and size and motion into the idea of something bigger that's moving and, and it has certain characteristics, right? So we put all these simple ideas together to form more and more complex ideas. He also talked about primary versus secondary qualities. And we had people that talked about this uh, in the last chapter as well. So primary qualities, again, are things like color or shape or motion, but things that are actually properties of the objects in the real world. Whereas um, secondary qualities are things that, that we perceive but are not actually part of the object. So, sorry, I misspoke. Color would not be a primary quality. Color would be a secondary quality because color is not actually a property of an object. It's something that our mind perceives because of the way that the light bounces off of the object. But that's something that exists in our mind. It's not something that exists in the object itself. Right? So prim primary qualities would only be characteristics of the objects themselves. So maybe it's size, it's mass, it's shape. Uh, it's motion, things that, are, that have to inherently be properties of the object. Interestingly, so Locke had a lot of different theories. Um, some of them were a little far-fetched, but some of them were pretty surprisingly modern if we think about them today. So he was one of the first people to propose systematic desensitization for phobia, something that we still use in psychology today. So as an example, he said, well, if you have somebody that's afraid of frogs, what you would do is you get a frog and you put it in a room far away from this person who has this fear of frogs and you let them be comfortable seeing the frog from across the room. After they're com fully comfortable with that and they, they're not afraid of the frog being across the room, then you get them to stand up close to the frog. And that's probably going to cause them some anxiety at first, so you, you, you just stop there and you give that time and you let them be comfortable being closer to the frog. And once they're comfortable with that, then you let them actually touch the frog, right? And that's probably going to be anxiety provoking. So you kind of let them stay at that stage until they're comfortable with touching the frog. And then you just let them handle the frog, right? And, and through this systematic process of slowly acclimating themselves to whatever it is that they're afraid of, they'll eventually lose that fear. And this is still a way that, that people treat all kinds of phobias in psychology. So he was very advanced in, in this theory um, for the time that he proposed. 
So Locke was one of the first people to propose that the mind was blank at birth. Now, he's not the one that actually called it a tabula rasa, which is the, the blank slate theory that you hear. You may have heard of it before, but this actually gets talked about a lot today. And Locke gets credit a lot for it, but he actually didn't call it a, a blank slate. He called it a blank sheet of paper. So he basically said that the mind was a blank sheet of paper, and the only way to write on that paper is through experience. And it was really this counter-argument to any sort of innate ideas or, or truths that were born in, that, pe that people were born with, right? It's a little different from blank slate theories that we see today. Locke was maybe a little bit misunderstood because some of his writings, he didn't publish them right away and they didn't get published until after he died. And so some people made assumptions about what he was saying when Locke wasn't really there to defend himself anymore. Um, so Locke, even though he had this blank sheet of paper idea for the mind, he may or may not have been extreme in saying that there's nothing in the mind than, than experience. Um, he may have allowed for the mind to have the ability to, at least the ability to acquire experience or know what to pay attention to or know how to make sense out of sensor, sensory information things like that. He didn't specifically say that those didn't exist. So there's a question about how blank his blank slate was. But he was one of the first people to kind of really go in that direction of saying that the mind is, is completely, it's, it's like a, a blank canvas, so to speak. Um, so there, there's, kind of departing from Locke for a second, there's some important consequences to having this view of the mind as a blank slate. And you'll see this theme in some of the other empiricists that we talk about, and, and, and it's still around today for, for others who might have this view. Um, child rearing or education is very important if you assume that the mind is blank from birth. It means that Everything that is that you're going to come to know about the world, or every everything you are, your personality, um, the things that you believe, the way that you behave, is all going to be a product of learning. And if that's the case, if if learning is all that matters, then the way to to create or raise the best child is going to be to start educating them as early as possible and start to teach them things. Uh, as soon as they're born and teach them as much as you possibly can. We'll see some extreme examples of that in the next couple of slides. Um, has some important views for politics as well. So from a political standpoint, from a social standpoint, if everybody is blank at birth, then governments should be highly respectful of people's individual rights and do the best to, propose, to promote positive development of their citizens. Governments then would have a primary responsibility of making sure that people are raised correctly and then society will be as as good as it possibly can be, right? That's what government can do to make society productive and useful and law-abiding is to provide for people to be taught and raised uh, quote-unquote correctly from the time that they're born. So this has big implications. This is why Locke's writings were really, really influential to the American and French revolutions, because this was a primary characteristic of the Bill of Rights and the French Revolution, is that individual rights mattered so much. And the reason that people were really tuned in to this view of individual rights mattering so much is because it was coming from the standpoint that individuals can essentially have this potential to become whoever they can be. They, they, they're going to be shaped by their experiences and by their upbringing. So we need to make sure everybody has the opportunity to flourish and to be the best individual they can be. And that's a responsibility of government if you're assuming that everybody is born blank, right? And so that's why a lot of Locke's writings on this kind of blank slate tabula rasa view, even though he didn't maybe go that far into saying that the mind is completely blank. But it was very influential in, in, in being something that people referred to when they wanted to fight for individual rights. 
All right, next we'll move to George Berkeley. So George Berkeley went even further than John Locke. He was an extreme skeptic. He essentially proposed that we can't know if anything exists other than our perceptions, right? So his, his basic theory was things only exist when they are perceived, right? So, so his, his often quoted statement is to exist is to be perceived. So that things only existed when they were perceived. Um, so if that's the view, right? So that's, that's what, that was his view of, of reality, right? And so if that's the case, then to, to Berkeley, ideas are the only things that exist because that's the only thing we can be aware of or that's the only thing we can know are our ideas. And remember, ideas... I'm going to use ideas a lot in this when we when we talk about this chapter. When we talk about ideas, we're specifically talking about components of mental life, right? It's not like you had an idea uh, for how to write your paper. You had an idea for how to invent something new. Any aspect of mental life, a perception of a color, a memory, uh, remembering a song, those would all be ideas in this sense. And so to Berkeley, ideas or these perceptions of mental life, our mental life is the only thing that's real. He used this, he was, a, he was religious, and he used this to argue that the only reason that the world seems permanent or that we can rely on things to be permanent in our world is that was a consequence of God's infinite perception of the entire world. So because God is always and forever perceiving the entire world, the entire universe in its entirety, um, that's why it was always there. That's why it seems so permanent to us is because God is actively perceiving it. And so that, that let him kind of maintain this rule or, or this theory that the only, the only way to know that, that things exist or the only things that exist are our perceptions of them. All right. So, I guess the, the argument would have been, well, then why does everybody perceive the same world if our perceptions are the only thing that we have? Doesn't that give us some indication of reality? And so Berkeley's answer to that was, well, God is actively perceiving everything all the time, and so that's why it seems permanent. Um, another consequence of this for Berkeley is that there's no such thing as primary qualities, right? There's no such thing as qualities that can be said to be qualities of the thing that you're perceiving, right? If we see a rock rolling down a hill, prior to Berkeley, we would have said, well, th there are some primary qualities, things that are, that are qualities of the rock itself, uh, the speed at which it's moving, its size, its shape, things like that that we can perceive. Those, those have to be qualities of the rock. Well, if Berkeley's basically saying that there is no real world except what you're perceiving and your perceptions are all that's real, then that would mean that all qualities are secondary. Everything that you perceive is something that exists in your mind, and that's all, all that you know of. So every single there's no difference between primary and secondary qualities in that sense. Everything is a secondary quality. He did a lot of work, George Berkeley did a lot of work on vision, and I guess that's something that I could probably throw in. Um, a lot of the the work that we're talking about in terms of British empiricists and then again with the associationists, it's largely about perception. Um, whether, whether A lot of it's about visual perception, but some of it goes on to, to other types of perception, hearing, smell, touch, taste. Um, this is an area of psychology, and unfortunately there's not a class here that teaches sensation and perception, but that's one whole branch of psychology is sensation and perception. Some people spend their whole career studying sensation and perception, and they're essentially focusing on a lot of the same ideas that are developed uh, during this period, during the empiricism period. Um, because most of psychology, or most of the theories at this time, are dealing with the psychology of perception. How do the sense organs take information from the world and turn that into mental life? So Berkeley did a lot of this work in vision. And in George Berkeley's spirit, being an extreme skeptic, 
and saying that perceptions are all we have, he kind of set out to show that our perceptions of things can't necessarily be rational. So one of the ways he attacked this is, is to argue how it's not, it's not rational for us to assume that the world we live in is three-dimensional. He said, how do we see in 3D? Because our eyes are two-dimensional, and the light from the world that hits our eyes, it hits the back of the eye in a two-dimensional plane. There's no three-dimensional recreation of the light image from the world that hits the back of our eye. So there shouldn't be a way for us to perceive the world in three dimensions unless our, our mind is using some cues to create those perceptions or to make assessments of three, of three-dimensional life. And so he argued very, very carefully and very convincingly that we're probably not born with the ability to perceive the world in 3D. This is something that we have to learn how to do. Um, and he demonstrated that there are some cues that give us some indications about how we can perceive depth and that until we learn these cues, we have no rational way to perceive depth, right? So. So some of the base, those basic characteristics, you probably learned about them in Psych 100, are that if one object is in front of another object, we know that it's closer, right? So we use that as a cue to perceive depth. If objects that seem closer to us tend to be bigger, so we use size as a cue for depth. Um, and when, we, when something is closer and we're looking at it, our eyes actually cross a little bit. When something's further away, our eyes are more parallel. And so we actually can take that information about how crossed our eyes are to know how close the thing is that we're actually looking at. So, so he argued very convincingly, and, and psychological research since then has shown these to all be true, that we can we use these different cues to form a three-dimensional picture of the world but we don't have enough information to actually know that the world is three-dimensional so some later psychological schools um, some some of the work that was done in psychology in the early 1900s some of the early German gestalt psychology showed that you can you can actually fool the mind into perceiving things that aren't actually there because we can take advantage of some of these cues. A lot of the optical illusions that you look at are a result of tricking the mind into thinking that there's depth when there really isn't. Um, so really interesting work that Berkeley was doing at this time. So in conclusion, to sum up George Berkeley, he said that there's, there's not a rationally justifiable way to say that the physical world exists. We have to just learn this through our interaction with our mental life, right? But there's nothing that would say, there's nothing that can prove the existence of the physical world, right? That, that sounds really very matrixy. But in an extreme sense, it's a, it's a good logical argument. Um, it didn't make a lot of people comfortable, but we can say that all we really know of our perception, all we really know are our perceptions, right? And our perceptions are not necessarily direct, direct representations of the physical world. And we know that our perceptions uh, actually tell us more information than they should, right? Because, because our, our perceptions of the visual world that we live in we get more information than than is actually there, so our mind is creating some of that. So, so it's actually a very interesting and convincing argument that he makes about well, we can't we can't know for with any sort of certainty that the the physical world is actually there. Um, just a a last fun fact: um, George Berkeley did travel some to the United States. He never went much further west than Rhode Island, but they actually named University of California at Berkeley, one of the most prestigious universities in the country, is named after George Berkeley. Okay, then we get to David Hume. David Hume is probably one of the most influential of the empiricists. Um, he was a philosopher. He was Scottish. And he basically took... he took the, the, all the work that came before him 
from Hobbes and from Locke and from Berkeley. And he wrote a few books that argued very convincingly, um, even though people weren't really comfortable with it, that there is there's no way to establish that anything that we could ever want to know is cer- is true with 100% certainty, right? So he thought it, it was foolish to try to justify that we know anything for sure, right? Essentially agreeing with a lot of those that came before him that all the mind has access to is its own perceptions and those perceptions can be flawed. And so we can't necessarily know anything with 100% certainty But what's more important is to try to understand human nature and the way that people typically behave because that's more useful. He was a strict empiricist, so the only thing that he saw in consciousness was sensations, so traces from our sensory uh, sensory information. He was a a pretty strict atheist, so he he left God out of all of his theories. and he believed that because the only thing we can know are the contents in our in our mind, and because those can be flawed, we can't be certain of anything. Right. So, so instead of dwelling on that too much, Hume just set out to understand what was in those contents of the mind. So, because that's all we can know, he wanted to focus on how we can understand what was in the mind. Um. So one, he said, what are those contents? And two. How do they get there? So he he broke the contents of the mind up into a couple of different things. The first was perceptions. So these really, perceptions to, to Hume, are any sensory experiences that you can have. So again, talking about sight, sounds, touch, taste, smells. Um, then impressions, perceptions led to impressions. Um, these are the really vivid, strong, actively experienced perceptions of the world. So when you are actively seeing something, when you are hearing something, these are impressions. We're, we're, we have these impressions of the things that we are seeing, we're hearing, we're touching, we're tasting. And then we have ideas. These are like copies of the impressions that we think about later. And ideas can be impressions that are organized differently so we can come up with ideas of things that we haven't actually experienced but we can only come up with these novel th- ideas using the components of the impressions that we've already had so one common argument for a lot of the empiricists was that okay so all of your impressions come from your perceptions and your ideas have to be built on impressions so we can we've maybe seen uh, a horse before, and maybe we've seen a bird before or anything else with wings. So we might be able to imagine a winged horse, like a unicorn or something like that. Um, I guess a unicorn w- would be the combination of a horse and, and something else with a horn. A pegasus would be a winged horse. But, um, but we have the ability to imagine these things that we've never actually perceived because we've perceived their components, right? So we can take this past impression of a bird and its wings, and we can kind of take those wings and mix it with our impression of the horse, and that gives us this idea of uh, a winged horse, a pegasus, that we've never actually experienced, right? But what he said was impossible is to imagine something that we've never had in our impressions first, right? So... He also, and this is maybe what Hume is most famous for, is challenging causality. So he started talking about how ideas become associated with one another. And his legacy is is actually in showing that our belief in causation is not justified. That that there's potentially no such thing as cause and effect. Um, So he showed that this is something that we just infer, right? Um, so his example was, if you're, if you're playing pool, or he called it billiards in his article, um, what causes the pool ball to go into the pocket? Well, most people would say, if I, um, if I shot the cue ball and I knocked the eight ball into the pocket, the cue ball caused the eight ball to go into the pocket, right? And... 
Hume took a step back and said, well, that's just kind of inference because you witnessed the cue ball striking the eight ball and you witnessed the eight ball going into the pocket. So you kind of make this inference that it was the cue ball that caused the eight ball to go into the pocket. But you had to hit the cue ball with the cue stick first, right? So why isn't the cue stick the cause of the eight ball to go into the pocket? And if you didn't shoot the, the, if you didn't walk up to the table first and, and cause the cue stick to strike the cue ball, then the eight ball wouldn't have gone into the pocket. So why isn't walking up to the table with the cue stick in your hand in the first place the cause of the eight ball going into the pocket? Or why isn't going to the pool hall in, to begin with the cause of the eight ball going into the pocket? And you can see how you can keep going back and back and back forever if you wanted to all these other infinite causes, right? So Hume is basically saying that we don't have any reason to believe that one thing causes another, but when we observe the world and over time we notice that some event tends to perceive, um, precede some other event over and over and over, over again, we start to assume that that first event causes the second event. But to him, causation is just a name that we give for this pattern that we've observed over a period of time that really doesn't have any other reason to be, be called cause and effect. So he said, essentially, when we associate ideas together over and over again, habit leads to our belief in the world, right? And so he's essentially saying that habit, our, our habit of looking around the world and assuming that, that things go together is what leads us to believe that the world exists and it's constant, right? So as an example, if you look around the room that you happen to be sitting in right now and then you close your eyes, for a couple of seconds and then you open your eyes again and you look around the room again everything should stay the same so you if you do this enough and you I'm sure we've all done this plenty of times we fall asleep we wake up we go into the same room and it's the way it was when we left it um, because those perceptions tend to be the same we assume that the world is pretty constant and that's a functional belief but it's not something that we can rationally justify. We can't necessarily say that we know with 100% certainty that the world is always the way it is, even when we're not there. Um, it's just something that we assume through habit, right? To be clear, so this kind of turns the world on its head. Hume is basically saying that we can't believe in causality, with, or we can't rationally believe in causality. It's just something that we assume out of habit. He's saying that um, our belief in the physical world is also a product of habit just because of witnessing the same perceptions over and over again. Um, so that seems pretty skeptical, but he was not necessarily a complete skeptic. What he was challenging was the notion that we could say that anything was 100% certain. It wasn't like he was saying that the physical world wasn't there. Um, he was just saying that there's no possible way to prove the physical world. So it was more important to just understand how the mind worked because that's something that could maybe be useful for us. Okay, so that was a lot so far. We, we've talked a lot about in the empiricists, the British empiricists. And so hopefully what you walked away from, from that first part of the lecture was that the British empiricists were strong advocates of experience and they were really focused on the contents of the mind. So Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, they all rejected the existence of innate ideas. They were 100% convinced that all of our mental life is a product of experience, right? So this existence of innate ideas would have been something that we would maybe associate with Plato. That going away from that and saying that everything we know comes from sensory experience is more in line with Aristotle, right? So Hume was really kind of, you could say he almost came up with this theory of associationism because he was talking about how perceptions lead to um, these impressions, impressions turn into ideas. And 
they turn into ideas through association, through kind of repeated linking of, of different ideas over time, right? So this turned into this theory of associationism to explain how we learn about the world, how we make sense of the world around us, how we understand what our perceptions are telling us about the world. Um, and so this started to become formalized. So this British empiricist movement led to what is called British associationism. So the people that followed Hume started to really formalize this theory and try to try to write down, so what are the laws of association? How do these impressions or ideas get linked to one another in the mind? So how does our mind actually start having these big complex ideas about the world? What are the rules that, that show how all those ideas are linked together, right? So it's an associationism is this empiricist philosophy. It's based on this notion that, that the mind, what the mind does is it gathers information about the world through perceptions. And then we form associations between ideas through habits, right? So when, when we do this over and over and over again, we start to form associations and this is what actually leads to knowledge. So this theory, this associationist perspective, is probably highly influenced by what a lot of people were doing in physics and in chemistry at the time. They were finding out that the, the physical world is made up of these fundamental particles or fundamental elements, and that when you join these fundamental elements, you get the more complex physical uh, objects that we come to see and perceive in our world. Right? So you're just applying that to mental life and trying to take the same approach if you're a British associationist. You're saying mental life is made, made up of just really fundamental elements, and those are called impressions or perceptions or ideas or whatever you want to call them. And then they get associated with one another, and this is what leads to our more complex ideas or thoughts about how the world works. All right, so... The most prominent associationists that kind of ran with this theory were four guys, David Hartley, um, James Mill, and John Stuart Mill, who was James Mill's son, and Alexander Bain. So let's talk a little bit about each one of these, these guys and what they contributed. So first of all, David Hartley, he came up with this notion of what was called... Uh, uh, vibrationcles, or I'm not exactly even sure how we pronounce this, vibrationcles. Um, essentially what he was proposing is that the ideas, the, the sensations, the perceptions, these basic elements of thought that we have in our mind, uh, they come from vibrations in the nerves. So he assumed that sense organs, when they come into contact with information from the world, they just vibrate a little bit. And these vibrations in the nerves are what lead to, those are what ideas are. They lead to ideas. Um, he also proposed that so simple ideas come together to form complex ideas. So that's, again, this idea of association. Um, what was important about his notion of association here is that he thought that um, complex ideas might not be able to be broken down into the simple ideas that formed them. Um, you're going to see this come up again when we talk about John Stuart Mill. He kind of expands on this thought. But so the notion here is we might have some simple ideas. They come together and they form a complex idea that has a lot of the elements of these simple ideas, but it's not completely reducible to the simple ideas. There's maybe a little bit more there. That's an important notion um, for later associationists. And when we start talking about early German psychology, and the Gestalt psychologists that was very influential to them. All right, James Mill was a, we'll start with his background. He was a follower of Jeremy Bentham. Jeremy Bentham founded utilitarianism. So utilitarianism is this philosophy that the goal of society is to structure it in a way so that you achieve the greatest good for the greatest number of people. Jeremy Bentham actually took this to an extreme and tried to quantify the way to do this. He came up with what was called utilitarian calculus, where he was essentially trying to put a number on the amount of good associated with every single behavior that somebody could engage in. 
and then tried to find ways to maximize the good for everybody by promoting certain behaviors, right? So it's a very grandiose theory. Jeremy Bentham was kind of a grandiose guy. If you're ever interested, look up pictures of Jeremy Bentham, his dying wish. I think we might have mentioned this in class before, is that when he, when he died, he wanted his body to be preserved and stuffed and his head mummified and, and put on display. And so it actually is. It's in uh, a university college in, in London, I believe, where on display you can actually go and see behind this glass case Jeremy Bentham's body, his actual body, stuffed and preserved, um, sitting in a chair and um, kind of looking out at the room and he's got kind of this, so there's a, a fake model head that was attached to it, but his real head, his mummified real head is actually sitting on the floor between his feet on display as well. Um, so if you're interested, look up pictures of Jeremy Bentham and you'll see a picture of what's still on display of him today. Um, anyway, so he founded utilitarianism. James Mill followed this view. Um, and so... He was kind of trying to find a way to come up with a theory of the mind that was that was consistent with this utilitarian worldview. Um, he built on what David Hartley Hartley came up with in terms of uh, associations between ideas, and he focused a lot on um, how to come up with the strength of an association or, or what caused differences in the strength of associations between ideas. He said that the strength of associations vary because of vividness and frequency. So when we perceive something more vividly, maybe it's a louder noise or a brighter image or just even you could say a more emotional experience, um, the things that are, that are more vivid are going to be more closely associated with one another. Things that are not as vivid or not as prominent when we perceive them are not going to be associated as strongly. Frequency was the other big thing. If we tend to experience ideas or perceptions in sequence um, over and over and over again, the more often that you pair these two things, the, the stronger the association is going to be between them. If you think about it, we haven't talked about behaviorism yet, but this is a really key idea in learning behavior, right? So the, the more you more often you pair things together. If you th want to think about um, just the early um, Pavlov's dog experiments, right? We're all about pairing a stimuli with a response. And the more you pair them, the more they will become associated, right? So this is where those ideas are starting. Um, so James Mill is, is proposing that vividness and frequency are the things that increase the strength of associations of ideas. He also... Um, agreed with Hume that causation is just a name for the order that events typically happen, right? So if we see events that one follows another in the same order and we see that very frequently, then we're going to come to associate those ideas over and over again. And we give ca the causation is the name that we give to that. But Mill proposed that that was a name only, that it wasn't something that Actually, there's no such thing as causation in the physical world. It's just a, a simple name that we give to this association of paired events that we see over and over and over again. Right? So then we have um, John Stuart Mill, or J.S. Mill, who is James Mill's son. So the interesting, and potentially interesting, kind of sad maybe, thing about J.S. Mill is that so his father was a strict associationist. So like we talked about before, learning was really, really important. And he sought to shape John Stuart Mill's experience from an early age and to teach him everything we could. And so this probably helped John Stuart Mill be one of the most, uh, most well-educated people that we've ever come across in literature, and he was extremely bright on top of that. So he was one of the most well-spoken, well-written, well, he, he probably just had more knowledge than almost anybody that ever lived, as far as we know. But it also led to a lot of trouble for him as well. Um, 
he had several really strong depressive episodes and he wrote a lot about how difficult he felt his childhood was. Now to give you an, an idea of why he's perceiving this as difficult and what I mean by extreme nurture in his upbringing. John Stuart Mill was taught to read Greek by the time he was three years old. He was put in charge of teaching his other siblings, he had, I believe, eight brothers and sisters, by the time he was eight years old. So he had been taught so much by the time he was eight, he already spoke multiple languages, he had already been, he was starting to read the classic works of Plato and Aristotle by the time he was eight years old, and he was put in charge of teaching this all to his younger brothers and sisters. By the time he was 12, he was starting to work on early drafts of his father's manuscripts, right? So he really didn't have a childhood childhood. He was, he was educated. He was given formal education from the time that he was born. And although he turned out to be an extremely intelligent and well-educated person, he also had a lot of depression in his life um, that he attributed mostly to um, just kind of the strictness that, that his father raised him with. And, and, and as smart and intelligent as he was, he always kind of considered himself a failure and he attributed that to his father's upbringing as well. So we come back to, I told you we were going to come back to this notion that complex ideas can be generated by simple ideas, um, but that they weren't necessarily just components of the simple ideas. So James Mill proposed, proposed mental chemistry, and it was largely based on this idea. So this is kind of analogous to the way that, so water is the combination of two hydrogen and one oxygen atom right? So we put those three atoms together and we get water, but we can put two hydrogen and two oxygen atoms together and we get peroxide, right? Which is very different from water. And you can't necessarily just, it's not that water or peroxide are just different mixtures of hydrogen and oxygen, right? It's just, it's something that's completely different once you put those, those elements together. And so what Mill is, J.S. Mill is proposing with mental chemistry is that it's something very similar for mental ideas. So uh, maybe simple ideas come together and they give rise or they generate more complex ideas, but the, these complex ideas aren't reducible to these simple images anymore. Um, so this is maybe why sometimes we can perceive things like depth or three dimensions that aren't actually you can't actually break those down into just the simple elements of perception that had to lead to them. There's more there than the basic, the basic simple perceptions that, that we started with, right? So this is, this is kind of a, a new and groundbreaking idea about how ideas become associated. Um, he also had some early beliefs about personality. He called it about the laws for the development of character. Um, so, the idea here is that if there are laws for the development of character, that's saying that personality is something that results from your experiences. So if you have certain experiences throughout your life, you'll develop a certain kind of personality. So J.S. Mill believed in this, thought that, yeah, that's probably how personality works, that, that through the experiences you have, your personality is probably shaped in a certain way. And, and that would mean that, that you're not born with a certain personality. It's the product of the experiences you have. Um, but he said that he did not believe that this is something that could be empirically te tested. Essentially, he said that if you were to test this, you would have to be able to record the every single experience and perception that a person has from the time they're born till the time that they're an adult so that you could you could measure how how their experiences led to their personality. He said that that's not practical. It's not possible. We can't gather that much data, so that study can never be done. But he still believed that that's how it worked, right? So if anything, this is maybe an argument for why the study of something like personality, J.S. Mill didn't think that you could actually do that scientifically 
because it wouldn't be possible to gather the data that it would take to conduct the study in the first place. All right, and finally, the last associationist we'll talk about, Alexander Bain. So he started developing theories about the effects of pleasure and pain. So again, this comes back to utilitarianism. It's all about maximizing the greatest good for the, for the most people. And so he thought, well, if you want to get very general, if you want to break all of life down into its most basic characteristics, you can say that all of, all of our experiences can be said to either give us pleasure or pain. And he said that the way that we learn how to behave is that we kind of behave randomly. We kind of move around and just kind of exhibit random spontaneous behavior. And some of those behaviors will lead to pleasure and we'll end up repeating those. And some of those behaviors will lead to pain and we'll start avoiding those. And then eventually we'll learn how to behave appropriately or, or, or our ultimate behavior um, and our notion of, of free will or what we think is voluntary behavior is really just this learned pattern of doing the things that have led to pleasure and avoiding the things that lead to pain. Uh, so this was, again, very influential for early behaviorist psychology. Um, and we'll see that come back again in a couple of chapters. Bain could be said to have published the first psychology journal. It was called Mind. He published it in 1876, so a little bit before the first experimental psychology labs. But, um, but did publish this first psychology journal. And so you could talk a lot about Alexander Bain being one of the first, the founders of psychology in a way. So these are four prominent British associationists that contributed a lot to ideas of the mind and how the mind works that are still with us today. Hopefully what you see is the common thread that underlies them is that they're all just concerned with, with understanding psychology by understanding the way that the mind perceives the world. So how does the mind come to, to contain these basic perceptions? And then how do the basic perceptions get associated with one another to form more complex mental ideas? So it was all about understanding what the contents of the mind were and how they linked up to form the mental life that we experience. Okay, at this point we're going to take a little departure from the investigations of psychology and talk about positivism, which kind of ends up blending in with psychology as a science as, as we go forward. But positivism was more about science rather than psychology or mental life. So positivism, the, the basic tenet of positivism is that you can only know things that you can observe, right? We can't propose the existence of things that are not actually observable and thus not measurable. And that's why it becomes important for, for sci formal scientific methodology and psychology as a science. So Auguste Comte was the founder of positivism. He was a founder in a pretty major way. Um, so he was French. He grew up idolizing Benjamin Franklin, referred to him as the modern Socrates. Um, it's important to know that he was growing up right after the French Revolution. Um, so he grew up in this time where um, his world was chaos, right? So he had just seen the French monarchy overthrown by this revolutionary group that wanted to completely restructure society. And so that was highly influential to Comte. He, he, so he, he kind of took that on as a goal. His goal was to, was to propose a way to reorganize society to align it much more closely with science. Um, incidentally, he was committed to an insane asylum twice during his life, um, both involving romantic uh, interests of his. Um, one, I believe, when when he just had a fallout with um, his first wife, and and second, when his the love of his life passed away. Um, so what he is one of the things that he's most remembered for is a theory of progressive stages of government based on kind of the predominant worldview of the culture at the time. So so he said that government kind of moves from 
government or, or, or social organizations move along a continuum, and that, that this happens throughout history. He said that governments start at a theological stage, and this is when priests rule and everybody assumes that spirits are in control of matter in terms of explaining the world. So an example of this would be assuming that planets move in orbits because God controls the planets, right? So the, the world is being explained through uh, in, a, in a very spiritual way. So he proposed that after the theological stage, that governments move to a metaphysical stage. This is where aristocrats, the, the, the rich and wealthy classes, rule. And essences control matter. Um, so an example of this would be that planets move in orbits around the sun because circles are perfect. Circles are these essences. And, and that's why the planets move in that sense. So it's you're not explaining it through spirits, but you're explaining it through what we would call a metaphysical explanation. There's not something, there are no physical laws there that are explaining it. We're just saying that circles are the perfect way for planets to move, and so that's why they move that way, even though now we know not all planets even move in, in perfect circles around the sun. And then finally, he said that uh, governments move to a more scientific stage, where scientists rule. Description is better than explanation. If we can describe how things work. We don't need to explain it. We don't need to come up with um, with explanations that involve phenomena that we can't measure. But if we can just describe everything and eventually predict everything, then we can have a really good understanding of the way that the the the, the world around us works. So, um, so if we can. An example would be then to explain that the planets move in orbits because of the laws of gravitational attraction. So we can formalize those laws, we can measure them, and we can propose their existence, right? And we can describe what we see. Um, so then, sorry, I jumped around with the slides a little bit there. There was then a backlash against Hume uh, from the common sense movement. And this backlash came from individuals who really were kind of disturbed by the notion that uh, Hume, on, on top of all the other empiricists, were basically saying that there, you have no reason to believe that the world is real as you perceive it. Um, that the, the mind is all that we can know and the contents of the mind are the only thing that's real. And so we have no rational justification for believing in a physical world. So as you might well understand, there were a lot of people that weren't comfortable with that notion. And so they established in Scotland what was called the common sense movement. And so Thomas Reed was one of the first common sense philosophers. Um, and so he was a realist. So that's why I kind of followed um, that notion of anti-realism for Mach with Thomas Reed's kind of takes the opposite perspective. He is a direct realist, and he says that we perceive the world through direct con contact with objects. So we perceive things because they're really there, is essentially what Thomas Reed is saying. Um, so his view was that we have, we do have some innate, our mind does have some innate properties. Maybe not innate ideas, but what he called nativism meaning this is something that you're born with. And he proposed that we're born with faculties that allow us to know the world ac accurately. This is a really early argument for saying that the mind is built to do certain things and to perceive the world in specific ways and to make sense out of our perceptions in a way that's been functional. This comes to be known as faculty psychology. And this is still a really prominent view today, especially in evolutionary psychology. It says that the mind uh, is not, it doesn't just take these general ideas and link them up through associations, and that's the only thing it does, that it has faculties that are actually meant to go out and understand the world in certain ways. Reed was also religious, felt that we were constructed by God to know God's world in a very particular way. So essentially God gives us certain faculties, and these faculties allow us to know the world. Dugald Stewart, who was one of Reed's students, took this a little bit further, um, 
uh, he he split the mind into specific faculties with specific f purposes. Um, James Mill, incidentally, was one of Stuart's students. So even though Mill was more of an associationist, uh, associationist he had been kind of instructed by Stuart in this faculty psychology approach. Um, so he probably developed a hybrid approach from the two. Um, it's important to note that the common sense movement, the Scottish common sense movement, was really the most influential philosophy to early American colleges. Um, they developed what was called moral psychology. It's psychology that faculties were put there by God to understand God's world in a specific way. Um, that is what most of the early American universities were founded on, the, the, those, that belief. And so it's still highly influential in a lot of American universities today because they all grew, a lot of them, you know, your, your universities that have been around for a long time, your Harvards, your Yales, your Princetons, um, these schools were built on this philosophy. So there's a rich and long tradition of the Scottish common sense movement in U.S. in the U.S. universities. Right. So this is this ends up being where we where we um, where we kind of take a split. And so for next week, we'll start talking about continental philosophy. So these are kind of the 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 more Plato view of the world uh, instead of the Aristotle view, right? The the yin to the associationist yang.